Hey guys, so in our previous edition of Monocle and Spade, I sat down with archaeologist and Old Testament scholar Dr. Douglas Petrovich to discuss his new book called The Origins of the Hebrews. And you may remember our discussion, we began to outline some chronological considerations and also some additional archaeological evidence for the Israelites in Egypt. Really some exciting stuff. In fact, I think it's the most important event in the entire Old Testament, as I've said before. So in this part two, I continue in the discussion with Doug about his new book and about some of the most amazing historical and archaeological evidence coming out of ancient Egypt literally in the past decade, if not more. So I hope you can join us as we continue with the discussion, part two of the origins of the Hebrews in ancient Egypt. Hope you can join us. Hundred and fourteen years before fourteen forty six, uh, in fifteen um, sixty, when the Hyksos were defeated by the native Egyptians. Wow, so so the history and the chronology fits. So so based on this chronology that we've sort of laid out, and that's in your book in much more detail. And again, I encourage people to uh, check out uh, Doug's book on Amazon. Also, the link on the bottom, the Origin of the Hebrews. Uh, and which uh, is a deep dive into literally hard archaeological and historical evidence for the Israelites in Egypt. And um, so, Doug, they're there for 430 years. Um, what do we know about in, in, in your research, in your book, uh, you talk about this, but um, what were they doing there? Were they building bricks the whole time or what do they have any occupations that they did? Yeah. And there are two occupations that we know about. Um, from um, you can add a third one, I suppose, at least late in the 430 years when there are um, tomb paintings in Thebes uh, from the time just before the Exodus that mention Apiru, which is the same as Habiru, and Habiru is the Akkadian version of Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it depicts, so these tombs depict Apiru, who are um, in, 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 the, in the vineyards. Um, uh, you know, tending to the vines. So they were involved in that activity late. But the two main occupations we know about are, first of all, uh, turquoise mining in Sinai. Uh, expeditions were sent both early and late in their stay there to, um, to southern or southwestern Sinai, a site uh, especially, well, first Maghara, but especially, and, and, and for the majority of the time, uh, to Sirabit el Khadim. And there they would um, be involved in this industry to extract turquoise from the, fr from, uh, from the rock. And so they, they, they dug out mines and they created these, these extravagant, beautiful turquoise, um, you know, uh, semi-precious stones mm -hmm. and then sold them on the open market. And so that was one industry that they were involved in. But the main industry of all things that they were inv involved in, and you know whether your listeners like this or not, Ted, I'm going to tell you the <laughs> truth. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is uh, a wine making and wine distribution. Hey. Industry. <laughs> yes. And especially the the distribution industry. They were middlemen because um, what Monfred Betok has demonstrated is that they were what is it? He, he estimates that I, I forget. It's either two million or three million. Um, uh, large Canaanite jars uh, during during this period were were transported from Canaan full of wine, wow. right? That was made in either northern or southern Levant, it, and both were involved, not one or the other. They were both involved. So so Egypt was buying this wine, and it was going through Avaris. So the Israelites were there to be the middlemen, and of course, as you know, with with a with a big industry, if you're the middleman. You can make a lot of easy money. Yes, right? <laughs> you're not involved in the industry. You're just, you know, you're just receiving and then shipping on. So um, that's how they became wealthy through through a that, wine distribution industry. 
And this is connected that one of the things you, one of the occupations you mentioned, Doug, was the uh, turquoise mining. And this is sort of connected to the other podcast that we did several years ago with you. And it's related to your first book, The Origin uh, or the, um, the World's First Alphabet. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, of course, what we're referring to here are inscriptions found in the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, I know we don't want to rehash that, but perhaps could you just give a little uh, quick thumbnail sketch of, of what we're talking about, about, and these, these inscriptions, what you, what you claim or what you propose in your book is that these, this is actually a proto-Hebrew language that's found in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, indicating that these Israelites were there mining turquoise. Is that correct? Right. That's correct. So the earliest involvement that the Israelites had there was, it was at Maghara, and it was in year two of Amenemkat III's reign. Cool. Uh, so he came on the throne, joined his father, the uh, uh, Sostris III, whom in my book I refer to as the Famine Pharaoh. So he he joined he joined uh, joined forces with his dad. He became the the de facto daily ruler, and his dad probably went into semi retirement. You know, still a king, <laughs> but making his son do all the work. And you know, why not? That's what exactly do. they retire. <laughs> so um, and it just so happens that according to a precise synchronization of Egyptian and Israelite chronology places the death of Jacob in year one of hmm. Amenemkat the third. Wow. And here it is, year two, we have evidence of these Israelites down in Sinai involved at the mines, hmm. um, uh, you know, in that industry to, to, uh, to make money through, through um, finding turquoise. So, but as the years progress there, there's a man named Chebeded who shows up on the scene. And um, so what the Egyptians did, Ted, is every year that they had an expedition go there, and it wasn't annual, you know, religiously, but in many periods, it was every year. And in the 12th dynasty, there was a period when Egypt was wealthy, and they sent an expedition, if not every year, then just about every year. And there's a man who was there for, for at least six of these um, expeditions named Chebeded. And there's a drawing at the base of these um, recordings. So the Egyptians would record the annual um, expeditions on what looks like a, an eight to nine foot tall tombstone. It's called a stella. And um, so they would record what happened this year at this campaign and you know, who came down and what they did and you know, how effective they were and what problems they experienced. So it's basically just like an autobiographical account of that year's expedition. And so at the base of these uh, in the years that Chebeded was there, he would draw a picture of himself on a donkey, a young man on the left, and a young man on the right. And the young man on the left um, it was always the same height, but the name changed. And he was clearly an Egyptian because it was an Egyptian name all the time. On the right, every time a, a new expedition went down there and he drew this, um, this um, you know, depiction of himself on the donkey with these boys, um, he would make the boy on the right, on the reader's right, uh, taller with each successive um, campaign there. And one time he named this child, this mm. young, young boy, and it's not an Egyptian name. It's wow. a, a Semitic name and it's the Semitic name Shechem. Wow. Which is fantastic because the, the, um, the list, there's only one place in the Bible that lists the sons of Manasseh. It's in chapter 17 of Joshua. And one of the names of the six sons of, of Manasseh is Shechem. Shechem. So all of a sudden, wow. Well, the guy on the donkey, what's his name? Chebeded. It's the only time, Ted, in Egypt's history where you have this name attested. The only time. It's a, it's a passive participle in Middle Egyptian. And it means he who was disfavored. He who was disfavored. Whoever gets the name, he who was disfavored. Wow. I mean, what kind of badge would that be to wear? Yeah. But yeah, why would you make that up if you're, yeah. Right. What happened when, when uh, it was time for Joseph to present his two oldest sons for blessings before Jacob, and the oldest one was supposed to get the birthright, the main blessing, right? Mm -hmm. Jacob swapped hands and put his, put his right hand on the, on the younger and his left hand on the older, and Joseph rebuked him and said, Dad, you've got it all wrong. This one is the, is the, is the uh, younger, and this one is the older, and you have to give the birthright to the older. And Jacob, you know, wily old Jacob, to paraphrase, said, oh, yes, my son, uh, the, the older will be great, but his brother will be greater. Hmm. So what happened there? 
favor was taken away from Manasseh. Uh, and that fits the name perfectly. perfectly. And the title, Ted, for, for Hebedeh is the brother of the ruler of Retchenu. And that title shows that he's lower than whoever the ruler of Retchenu is. And if you look at, a, at the contemporary um, mm -hmm. occupational phase at Etavaris, the second Asiatic occupational phase, there's a guy who's buried with a wealthy burial with all kinds of um, sheep and goats and donkeys, and of course a wife and kids, but um, an elaborate burial with elaborate grave goods, which includes gold and silver and you know uh, copper alloy and these other things in, in you know beautified form. Um, also, is his is his um, signet scarab there, and it's made of amethyst, so it's really um, you know um, rare and, yeah. and highly precious. And so this amethyst scarab and it's beautiful purple, right? And it's, uh, I have a, an electronic image of this that I made in my book. Um, and it, it says the name and the title holder of this person. And the title is the ruler of Retchenu. Wow. And he's a contemporary of this brother who went down to yeah. uh, the turquoise mines. And think about this, whoever gets the blessing from Jacob, it, it, he has the better deal at Avaris. So this guy's the mayor of Avaris. He's the ruler of retinue. Retinue. Yep. And retinue was Israel, right? Or Canaan? Canaan. Well, it was the whole Levant, northern and southern Levant. The Egyptians used the word retinue to mean um, the people who lived up there in the Levant. In the Levant. And so, so that's not saying where he ruled, but it's saying what is his derivation. He comes wow. from the land of the Levant. So, so the, but the name of this guy, who's, who's the mayor of the city, the name is D. Sobek M. Chat, right? Which means he who was appointed by Sobek M. Chat. So who is Sobek M. Chat that's so great that he appoints this guy as the ruler of Retchenu? And I'm connecting the ruler of Retchenu to Ephraim, the brother of Manasseh. Who, who appointed Ephraim as mayor of the city of Avaris where the Israelites lived? Hmm. Well, Sobek M. Chat, guess who he was? Joseph. He was the vizier, the second in command, and the first vizier under Sesostris III that I've, for a long time now, even before I knew of all these connections, uh, I've said, well, he's got to be the famine pharaoh. That's the way the chronology works. And wow. sure enough, his first vizier is named Sobek M. Chat. And, and to finish it off, Ted, and there's much more than this, but I'll, I'll leave it at this for now, unless you ask for more. Um, Sobek M. Chat. There is a funerary inscription that was found preserved in a secondary context in an earlier tomb mm. uh, of a different king at Dashur. And that's where um, all of this took place, where, where Sesostris III was buried and Sobek Amchat was buried. Um, but there was a, a um, funerary inscription that gives a title string. And among the titles is what we call a hapax legomenon. It's once used in the entire corpus of Egyptian literature. And it's used for this guy. Wow. Um, it's it's Herp Tatem, controller of the entire land. Wow. Controller of the entire land. Well, Ted, guess what? If you open your Bible to, to Genesis 41, 41, and you see what the king did with Joseph when Joseph interpreted these dreams for him, he put Joseph over the entire land mm. of Egypt. So this is the only recorded time in history we have this title used of a man, controller of the entire land, because otherwise it would be used of Pharaoh. It's a title that Pharaoh would keep, would have, I mean, right. if it even were used, but it's not even used for the Pharaoh. You see, he naturally controlled the entire land. And, and his, so are you saying, uh, Doug, that his tomb, this was perhaps his tomb in this inscription that was discovered? Well, his tomb is the first vizierial tomb. Uh, or, or uh, the one in closest proximity to the royal tombs, including the, the, uh, the, the royal pyramids, including the pyramid of Sesostris III. But his, his tomb, Ted, was found to be empty. There, there were fragments of inscriptions there that could identify him as Sobek Amchat. That much is clear. But the, the body, the French uh, excavators who um, dug the site um, um, over, uh, over 100 years ago now, they... Um, they recorded that the main occupant of that tomb, Sobek Amchat, his body was robbed out in antiquity, wow. which of course would fit with Joseph perfectly. Exactly. But this, this, um, this uh, 
the funerary inscription was not found in the tomb. It was carefully placed about a kilometer and a half away in a different tomb on the, on the knees of a, um, uh, of a statue that was preserved in the burial chamber of an earlier king demonstrating that somebody purposefully intentionally preserved this inscription mm. for posterity, wanting to find a, a faraway place to put it where nobody was going to disturb it. Right? Interesting. So if that's the Israelites who take away Joseph's body at Dashur at the time of the Exodus, they see the funerary inscription. What do they do? They say, you know, you know, we're going to go out of Egypt and we're no longer going to be speaking Egyptian, but let's preserve Joseph's inscription his funerary inscription so they go they walk you know a couple kilometers away and they they put it put it in this hideaway place and carefully preserve it there and they take his body and leave wow. well guess what this attests to joseph's role as as controller of the entire land of Egypt. so amazing so doug it sounds it sounds a lot i'm just going to go out on a limb here it sounds like you take the scripture seriously you actually believe the text and take it word for word that's Absolutely. really it really is amazing i'm kind of i'm kidding but i'm not but it's it's amazing when you actually follow the text and look at what the text actually says what you can discover if you if you just give it the benefit of the doubt yes and um, let's go back to a statement you made before um and and, and i wanted to mention this before um if you get the chronology right for israel and for egypt and, and now you synchronize them carefully, you now have a foundation. And as you were alluding to, if you, if you erode the, the foundation or you, or you form the for foundation poorly, right? You're building a house yep. and you do a terrible butcher, you know, hack job with the yep. foundation. I don't care how well you build the first, second, third, and fourth floors. It's going to come down in time, right? Right. So you've got to get the chronology right. And it, and it, it, you, you know, with it, you have to take the history seriously. You have to take the numbers seriously. You have to um, interpret them literally and not allegorically, like like the excavators at Tel Al Hamam are doing. You have to take it literally, and then all right. of a sudden, if you get all of that right, Ted, if you get the foundation right, you will be amazed with what you discover as you build up. Yeah, it's it's truly remarkable. Um, now we're we're just a few minutes time. We're gonna um, we're gonna probably cut this in half and do two two separate uh, you know versions of this, which is okay. We'll edit this out. But um, what I'll do is I want to kind of transition now to the actual Exodus itself. And uh, the next question I'll really want to uh, just propose to you is that based on this chronology that we have been following, this um, that you, you know you've outlined in your book. Um, this is actually in, I first read about this years ago when I was teaching Old Testament survey uh, back in North Carolina, and I was using uh, Eugene Merrill's book, Kingdom of Priests, mm -hmm. and I had read this, and it just kind of blew me away, and I want to kind of get your thoughts on this, and um, I, I'm guessing that's in your book as well. I have not quite gotten to it yet, but um, based on the chronology, Moses, uh, in, in his birth date, and uh, it seems like he would have been born um, sometime when uh, Queen Hatshepsut would have been a young girl and uh again there's no direct evidence of this but circumstantial evidence and all the chronology points to the possibility very good possibility that one of the most famous queens in egyptian history hatshepsut actually is the one to actually get moses from the nile and raise him in uh, in pharaoh's household and uh is it possible doug that that moses could have known or could have certainly been familiar with uh, thutmose the third uh could you speak to that sure and yeah, if, if we're doing this careful chronology of Egypt and, and Israel and synchronizing them correctly, what, what we end up um, uh, coming to terms with is that we can then identify which king, which Egyptian king was on the throne when Moses was born. And according to biblical chronology, and it maps it out clear enough for us, 1526 BC is when Moses would have been born. And it just so happened that in 1529, a new king came onto the throne named uh, well, we know of him as Thutmose the first, right? Yes. So if this is all true, if we if we get our our chronologies and our synchronization correct, Thutmose the third has to be the king on the throne, and so it has to be one of his daughters who um, pulls Moses, you know, in his reed basket out of the Nile River, and you know the story goes on. So who is this princess who pulls him out? Well, if you study the life of Thutmose the first, 
what you realize is he had um, a couple of daughters that we know about, but only one of his daughters um, lives um, out of childhood, right, into, into youth and then adulthood, and that's Hatshepsut. None of the other daughters of Thutmose the I um, live long enough to take this role that she could be, be the one who pulls Moses out of the water. So Hatshepsut um, is the perfect candidate just at the hard, raw evidence, right? Right. Well, what's amazing, Ted, is if you look at the, um, you know, many years later, decades later, um, so Hatshepsut, what happens is her stepson, Thutmose III, the son of um, uh, Thutmose II um, from a different wife, um, she, when, when he, when Thutmose III ascends the throne, he's a little boy. He can't yeah. make decisions for Egypt. Right. He's too young to reign. He's too young. So she jumps on or jumps in and, mm -hmm. and makes the decisions for him. And next thing you know, she's calling herself a king. Mm -hmm. So she, she became a female king of Egypt. No doubt about it. It's indisputable. And she builds this amazing mortuary temple at Dar Bari in the Valley yes. of the Kings. Truly yes. remarkable. Yeah. And right. Her building projects were almost unprecedented. You know, yeah. you, you, you almost have to go to Ramses II yeah. uh, to, to surpass her, her building um, achievements. But, um, but toward the, so what happened is she made herself co-regent or co-ruler with Thutmose the third. And she was the kind of the de facto leader in all of this as he was growing up as, you know, um, a young child into a boy and into a man. And in her 22nd year, she disappears off the throne. And this is only um, um, a short time after uh, Moses would have fled Egypt in shame, from the Egyptian perspective, at least. Right, right, right. right. Shame. And there was, you know, the Bible says that, um, that it uses a masculine pronoun for the king who chased Moses out of Egypt. And the fact is, they were both on the throne at the time. Thutmose the third and Hatshepsut, and of course he was older now, and you know he was already of age, um, so he would have been the one to chase Moses to try to find him and kill him, right? Not Hatshepsut, because it, again it's a Hebrew right. masculine participle. But a couple of years later, what happens with Hatshepsut? She all of a sudden vacates the throne, and Ted, this just doesn't happen in, in ancient yeah. Egypt. Why would you vacate the throne? You're at the top of the food chain. Right. You stay there until you die. Um, that's typical for a king. Mm -hmm. She doesn't. She vacates the throne and disappears from the record, essentially. And we don't know really what happens to her. But if you had a series of events like we read about in the Bible, where there's that shame and she is the mother, the adoptive Egyptian mother of Moses. Now there are forces pushing on her and there are all the internal things as a female, right? Right. Um, this was my son. And I'm, you know, she, she can't disassociate. I mean, as men, we, we can compartmentalize, right? Women right. can't compartmentalize. So she had the stigma around her that her son, her Egyptian son had committed the shameful act against the Egyptians. So she leaves the throne. And then what happens after her reign sometime and after the reign of at least, I'll say this, at least 20 years into the reign of Thutmose III as a sole ruler, not as, not as a co-regent, but as a sole ruler, um, sometime then or after, you have this campaign throughout Egypt to, mm. to desecrate and decimate any images or references to Hatshepsut, mm. right? Her name, basically. Her name, yeah, yeah. And, and any image of her. And that's significant in Egypt because, um, and my, my understanding Egyptian, uh, the worldview is that part of the reason why they, they wanted to create these massive monuments is that they, their name would be remembered. And so when you erase the name off, you're essentially taking, you're taking them out of eternal life or whatever. Is that right? That's exactly right. In the Egyptian religious world, if you destroy every image or reference to a person, you obliterate that person from eternity. Wow. And, and this is the dreaded second death for mm. the ancient Egyptians that nobody wants to endure. And, you know, it, it's almost unprecedented, right? Well, guess who mm. gets this treatment? Hatshepsut. And, you know, when it, when it makes sense, Ted, it makes sense when you have the 10 plagues and Egypt is devastated from this. And then, of course, the 10th plague is the worst of them all mm -hmm. because every Egyptian family experiences mm -hmm. the death of the firstborn child. 
Wow. So the entire the entire nation is in disarray. Then you have the debacle in the Sea of Reeds, right? When the army of the Egyptians um, goes after the Israelites to kill them off, but instead they die and don't return. Right. So everything is against the Egyptians. And so what ha would have happened is that Amenhotep II, the Exodus Pharaoh, and by the way, he survived the Sea of Reeds debacle. He didn't go into the sea with them. He survived. He returns to Egypt. He issues two edicts. One of them would be to desecrate every image of Hatshepsut throughout Egypt to mm. give her this dreaded second death. Mm. And then, Ted, and this is recorded on um, uh, a pink granite um, um, cylindrical inscription, right? It, um, by Amenhotep II. It records the, the, um, the extremely odd decree that all of the courtiers of Egypt are to, um, they are to destroy the, the idols in Egypt, the, the, the images of the gods, and those are idols. And there's one, one god that's named by name, which is wow. Amun-Ra. Wow. Amun-Ra is a composite god consisting of Amun plus the sun disk Ra mm -hmm. um, fused into one. And during the, the 18th dynasty, um, looking at Amenhotep II's reign and especially his predecessor, Thutmose III, and during Thutmose III's reign, Egypt reaches her height militarily, economically, financially, in, in, in slaves, in everything you can think of. They, they reach the pinnacle of Egypt's history. They are one of the two superpowers in the world. Mitanni is the other, and they are the greater one. It's like the Cold War, right? Yeah. US, USSR. So they're the greater power. And, um, and, and the God that, that Thutmose the third, um, gave glory and credit for all of these Asiatic victories was Amun-Ra. Wow. And that was passed on to Amenhotep the second. He venerated Amun-Ra the same way. And now all of a sudden on this pink granite inscription is the, the decree that not only are all the gods supposed to be killed or uh, desecrated, destroyed, literally it's the word destroyed in Egypt, but even Amun-Ra, the wow. god who gave them the victories in the Asiatic campaigns, wow. he, his images are to be destroyed throughout all of Egypt. That's unprecedented. And it, and, and it makes no sense. Like when you look at a causal factor of this, like, you know, like you said, when Tutmos the third was in power, it was like he was, uh, I've heard some historians call him the Napoleon of Egypt. He mm -hmm. was successful. What did he do? 17 campaigns yes. into, into Asia, uh, into the Levant. And then after Amenhotep II, uh, after the ninth year of his reign, he really does no more campaigns. He does a few early in his, in his reign. But then after the exodus in 1446, he essentially does no more campaigns. And this should not have been because, because Tutmos, his father, had placed Egypt at literally the pinnacle of world power at the time. So all the evidence, all the arrows point to Amenhotep II as the Exodus Pharaoh. And you go over this in your book in much more detail, right, Doug? That's right. And including in that, Ted, um, you have his final Asiatic campaign, which, by the way, um, I, I've corrected my own earlier view, um, suggesting now that it was year seven, not year nine, that it's a okay. mistake in the restoration of the Memphis Stella, where the year was listed there, okay. um, that it probably originally was, was a seven and they changed it to nine, just like they changed the, the first campaign from, from three to seven. Three is correct, seven is incorrect for the first campaign. So the final campaign of Amenhotep II, it becomes a glorified slave raid. And here's why it's weird, Ted. It's really weird to use a term from Is Genesis History. It's really weird. <laughs> you have all these campaigns from most of the thirds, like you said, 17 into um, Asia, making Egypt the military um, might of the ancient world at the time in the middle of the second millennium BC. And they advance all the way to the Euphrates River and even go down in his year 33 campaign, they go down the Euphrates River and, and um, attack communities, you know, like villages, one after another, and put them to the torch to show that this is their land. They're going to control Mesopotamia now, right? That's what Thutmose III did. That's how powerful he was. So um, you have this constant in increasing, improving, um, and, and stabilizing of these um, conquests throughout the 17 campaigns. And the, uh, and the first campaign of uh, Amenhotep II in his year three, it's to 
um, quell a rebellion because when his father died, Thutmose III, mm -hmm. the, the Canaanite and, you know, Levantine kings decided let's rebel because the king's dead. Well, he went in there and he crushed that rebellion, right? Killed a lot of people. He went all the way up to the border of Mitanni, their, mm -hmm. their, their co-superpower enemy, enemy number one. They went all the way up there, right, to the northern Levant. Now, his final campaign in year seven, that I, I'm correcting to year seven, um, all of a sudden, it's not moving further like his father did in his campaigns and, and conquering more land and, and regaining material, you know, land that had been conquered. It's shorter. They only went as far as the Sea of Galilee and not further north. But what did they do? It wasn't to attack cities. It wasn't to quell a rebellion. Mm. They took a hundred, roughly a hundred thousand slaves, which is absolutely bizarre. Now wow. you can you can say that yeah, I mean this is uh, hyperbole or whatever. And even if the number is hyperbolic, it still signifies an enormous number that was taken, right, in the short campaign. Why would they take it? Well, according to biblical chronology and and Egyptian chronology and synchronizing them together, November of the year of the um, of the Exodus, which took place in April. November of that year is when this campaign was launched. No kings launch uh, campaigns in November. And every Egyptologist who's talked about this campaign is at a standstill for understanding why this would take place. Well, among these 100,000 or so claimed um, captives, right, in the slave raid were 3,600 Apiru. Interesting. Apiru equals Habiru equals Hebrews. Hebrews. If you have, and, and, and in, in biblical history, this would be a, a quiet period because we don't, you know, right after the Exodus for like 18 months or whatever it is, there's no account of just what happened with the Israelites. And then all of a sudden there's more discussion. Well, several months into it in, in this quiet period, in, in, according to Moses, um, if you have a small group of the Israelites, right, who are wandering in the desert, they say, Moses, we've had enough of you. We're out of Dodge. They leave. And this is precedented with the Korah rebellion and other things, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's common that this would happen. Yep. If you have 3,600 of them who leave the group and say, hey, we want to go into Canaan now. 40 years living in this desert and dying here doesn't work for us. So off they go into, mm -hmm. into Canaan. They go up into Canaan. They settle down. And what happens? They God get decides to get back at them, right? Because wow. they're not supposed to leave the body of Israelites. They're supposed to kind of, you know, take the wounds that he says they're to take. So they go back into slavery, basically. Yeah. yeah. So slavery is the answer. So the king comes in and he's looking for slaves to replace the thousands and thousands of slaves of the um, Israelites who left the country. And they, they, were the, they were the gears that allowed the machine to work, mm -hmm. right? Take away the gears. There is no working That's machine. Right. And there's no and there's no economy and there's no yeah, no economy yeah, no income exactly. yeah and you're the world leader you're the world power so you have yeah. to reestablish that base right get your gear back for your machine so he goes and he gets he gets a uh, hundred thousand according to him a hundred thousand um, captives and while he's there guess what he stumbles on but these three thousand six hundred mutineers <laughs> and what does he do he takes them for himself and hauls them into Egypt and who knows what he does to them there. Wow. We, we where is this inscription? Where, where does he, where do you, is this inscription found? Is it multiple places uh, for, for, that you're, oh, the, yeah, the this, last, this, his last campaign? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this last campaign is recorded on what's called the Memphis Stella, Memphis okay. Stella, Memphis, Egypt. And is that where, isn't that where he had his, uh, was it his palatial, uh, his palace or his headquarters in Memphis, not in Thebes? Normally it was Thebes, but in the 18th dynasty, right. he was the, Am I correct in understanding he was the only pharaoh of the 18th dynasty to have his capital as a central government in Memphis and not in Thebes? Well, he wasn't the only, but he was one who who did it, who did okay. uh, keep it there. Um, okay. It was uh, Thutmose III, okay. the father of Hatshepsut, who was in, in uh, power when Moses uh, was born. He's the one who moved the, um, the headquarters from Thebes, which is where it had been from the 17th dynasty, right? Mm -hmm. Amosa that we talked about, the right. first last king of seventh, nine, 17th dynasty, first king of the 18th dynasty. Um, but because of his Thutmose the first desire to campaign into Asia and basically, you know, go up there and take, you know, 
uh, whatever he wanted from the peoples who were there. He knew it was a gold mine waiting to be mined. Um, he moved the capital to Thebes, which was in the north, which was closer to Asia to basically prepare for these um, Asiatic wow. campaigns. Wow. That's just remarkable. Well, um, we could just go on forever, and I wish we could, um, but I know I don't want to, I want to respect your time. Doug, uh, Dr. Petrovich, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, though, I want to just give you an opportunity to say uh, whatever else you'd like to say about your book. Please, uh, folks, get a copy of Origins of the Hebrews, uh, uh, the newest book on the, the historical and archaeological evidence, hard evidence of the Israelites in Egypt, beginning with when Joseph goes to Egypt during the famine, he connects the pharaohs and uh, and just all the way through the Exodus itself. And uh, they can get a copy on, you can get a copy on Amazon. You can also uh, follow the links uh, that we'll have here in the description that you can get a signed copy from Dr. Petrovich uh, if you'd like that. Doug, would you want to say anything more about your book? What do you want people to know about this book um, as we kind of wrap things up here? Yeah, and um, I'll start then by saying, Ted, I want them to know that this book is unprecedented in what is it has attempted to do. There's nothing of the kind. And I'm, I'm not even saying mine goes in different directions than other books. There's nothing of the kind that actually seeks to present yes. strong, hard, connected, um, intricate evidence on multiple levels in multiple forms of Israelites in Egypt for the 430 years that the Bible suggests the Israelites were there. But yeah, you can buy it in hardback on Amazon. You can buy it in Kindle on Amazon. You can buy it from my publisher, New Creation. And then the way that helps me the most, it gives me the best royalty. You can buy it directly from me. You can um, go to my Twitter account and look at how to, you can pay me through you know, Venmo or PayPal or send me a check. And I've already um, you know, sent out over a hundred at this point um, to people. So um, I'd love to send you a, uh, signed copy. They're they're only the introductory rate is four hundred dollars. I'm not sure. Or, I'm sorry, forty dollars. Forty dollars. Um, uh, and at some point that will change. But you can some academic it. books are about that much. Yeah. Though, Doug, well, I mean, and Ted, um, I may have told you this before, but one of the books that I bought for my to do research for my yeah. first book, the world's oldest alphabet. Only one. It was two volume set. Only one copy was available in the world. It's called Sinai, the Sinai Inscriptions from the 1950s. Um, and it was in the Netherlands. And the price was $1,800. Goodness. That wow. is what I had to pay <laughs> to get a book that I needed for my research. So knowledge, when you have specialized knowledge, it's, uh, it's very valuable. Yes. Folks, this is, even if it's 50, 60, 70 bucks, uh, this book is, uh, as, as Dr. Petrovich has said, is unprecedented. Um, and let me just say, uh, as a uh, archaeological apologist, if you will, uh, this is a strong antidote against the skepticism that we see rampant today that I'm, it's really disturbing, Doug, uh, that you see in the church, uh, people skeptical of God's word. Um, many Christian apologists are, are questioning some core historical things of the Christian faith. And um, I heard uh, Dan Wallace say this years ago. This is actually, I was actually in the Dallas area, uh, what, you know, looking at some manuscripts that are coming out of these mummy masks. And um, Dan said this, he says, an ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. I love that. I love that statement. An ounce of evidence is worth a pound of presumption. And there are hundreds of pounds of scholarly presumption, essentially questioning God's word, questioning the historicity of the text. And uh, not only do we have an ounce of evidence with Doug's book, we have hundreds of pounds of evidence. And um, tons, literally tons of evidence, literally in the granite and in the inscriptions that he talks about, uh, in the archaeological evidence that he goes over. And I cannot say enough about this. Uh, please get a copy of this. Um, and uh, this is just amazing. And it's an exciting time to be alive, honestly, to see God's word really come to life and to see the evidence firsthand for itself. And uh, I'm just very excited about this. And one other quick thing about as we wrap it up. Um, his uh, first book, uh, The World's First Alphabet, had been out of print for a while, and Doug, it's now back in print, and uh, is it also published by Carta, uh, continue to yes. be closed? Okay. Yeah, the so, reprinting is published by Carta, and you can buy it directly from them at their website. It's Carta Jerusalem. Carta Jerusalem, okay. Uh, is it also on Amazon as well? 
Uh, I don't think they have it up on Amazon, but you can buy it directly from their site. From Carta. Okay, we'll have that link as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Dr. Petrovich, it's been an honor once again to have you, brother, on the Monocle and Spade podcast, and uh, we'll be um, uh, posting this here very soon. Thank you so much for being on, and uh, God bless you. Do you have any new books or any new research directions you're going in as we sort of uh, say, uh, wrap it up? Yeah, I'm working on trying to come to an end uh, of a book I'm writing called Nimrod, the, em the Empire Builder, uh, Architect of Shock and Awe. Um, awesome. Not only <laughs> identifying Nimrod with a uh, historical figure from antiquity, but um, demonstrating the parallels between the two, which shows why this is the right person and kind of getting into, uh, you know, why is that little narrative about Nimrod in Genesis 10? And it's something that fascinates people, Ted. They it really is. love the story of Nimrod and want to know who this guy is. It so is um, he provides the model for an empire builder throughout can, history. Can I ask? Is am I am I? Uh, uh, can I ask? Is it Sargon the it, of a Sargon of a cod? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. The first empire builder in empire. history. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Well, we are looking forward to seeing that. And and people can see a little bit about that on uh, Is Genesis History, where uh, our friend Del Tackett uh, interviews you about the Tower of Babel. And uh, you're here in Chicago at the Oriental Institute. And uh, they can look at that clip on YouTube in which you talk about the Tower of Babel ex expansion, which we identify with the late Uruk expansion. Is that? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So this is cool. Very great stuff. Again, uh, thank you, folks, for uh, watching Monocle and Spade, listening to Monocle and Spade. Um, we are excited to be uh, back on track. We've been uh, out of pocket for a while. So thank you for your patience. And we are looking forward to uh, having some new guests coming up very soon. So thank you again for watching. And thank you to Dr. Petrovich for being on. God bless.